Hi everyone, I'm Vimo and I'm going to be sharing today's talk, which is brought to us by Fabio Diaz. That's how we call him. <laughs> He's changed his last name a little bit. Fabio Diaz Fabon. Welcome Fabio, welcome everyone else. And the work he's going to present on is joint work by the four people there, which includes myself and Marie Lebrant and Fabio. And Professor Savage from the LSE can't join us. So we'll have about 45 minutes, Fabio. And then we'll take some questions after that. Is that okay? Yes, yes, that will be fine as well. Okay, great. So until then, please mute your mics, everyone else except for Fabio. Ah. <laughs> okay, perfect. So welcome everyone, uh, everyone who just joined and people that are joining now. So my name is Fabio Andres Diaz Pavon. Uh, I am from Colombia and I am part of the Saldru Acer team at the University of Cape Town. So what I, we're doing here is we're going to do like a small presentation about something that we've been working almost for a year. This is something that has involved uh, the work of different academics. In, uh, and in this particular presentation, I, I'm talking of something that we have worked with Murray, Lebrand, Vimal Ranchot, Mike Savage, and me, but that actually has benefited from the knowledge and the expertise of a lot of uh, researchers in South Africa who have researched on this topic that make this kind of analysis feasible. Uh, so let's start with this. <clears throat> Let me click here. So where, where is this research coming from? So after, after several conversations with, between the, the four of us, it came to our, to our mind that there's a lot of knowledge in South Africa about inequalities, but the different streams of the research of inequalities don't necessarily talk to each other about uh, how they sp speak to international literature and all the experiences that, and, and all the insights that, that the South African context brings. And this uh, brought us to think initially of thinking about <clears throat> how the, the case of South Africa relates with experiences and literatures, including uh, Atkinson and Milanovic, and that brought us at the end to think about Piketty and his, and his new book. And the question is, why Piketty? <clears throat> the interesting thing is that Piketty in 2015 visited South Africa and he delivered uh, the Nelson Mandela public lecture. And in that one, he, he is explicitly reflected about inequities in South Africa and how to overcome some of the inequities in South Africa. Uh, and the interesting thing of, of that is that he not only engaged directly with the case of South Africa in that lecture, but in a way he gave like a sneak peek uh, to the idea that he was going to present in his newest book, uh, the 2020 book, right? And then like we found like then that it would be like a really interesting vehicle to, to bring the insights from the case of South Africa to international literatures and inequality by reflecting on this document, given that it's becoming a reference point for some of the debates about inequality. So let me present briefly what is gonna be the agenda, what we're going to do here, okay, click here. And <clears throat> we have basically five points. The first one is perhaps the most challenging one because we will try to summarize in one slide, pick it, that is bigger than capital in the 20th century. But I think, uh, we, we believe this is necessary to set the, 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 the baseline to have the discussion about these ideas and how that relates with the case of South Africa, right? Coming from there, we will start to analyze what is the contribution of, of Piketty to the debate that builds up on his work in 2014, but also brings a series of conceptual and methodological insights in the, into the thinking of inequality. And I'll go into, into detail later. Then what we will try to do is to reflect about the inequality of South Africa. I mean, usually there's a, a several reference points or, or tropes that are used to talk about inequality in South Africa and that is so unequal and, and so on, but it's important to think unequal in what extent or in what dimensions. And we'll try to present like a brief overview of where this inequality is coming from and how that relates with the current context. And from that point, we come to reflect on something that is not necessarily considered most of the times. And it's the fact that South Africa as a country as a, and as a case study can contribute a great deal of insights for the study and the policy making dealing with different inequities because it has implemented a series of policies, a battery of policies 
dating from 1994 trying to correct this uh, with different degrees of, of success. We'll come to that later. And finally, we just bring a reflection of what, what have we learned so far with this process and where that brings us to think about inequality, uh, not only in South Africa, but in the world. <clears throat> so this is uh, perhaps the most challenging part of the, of the whole presentation, so bear with me. So I'm trying to summarize a 1,104 pages book in one slide. But if we are going to talk about what, what Piketty presents in his new book, he basically presents a historical analysis, trying to link how the different discourses and representations of what is fair and just in relation to inequality take place in different societies across time, and how that is related to sociopolitical processes. To do that, he understates something that is called like long historical analysis. Basically, he goes long way back in history to try to understand this, right? And then he creates a, like a particular typology of different societies along which he wants to understand how this evolution of the notions and the understandings of inequality take place along the discourses and the policies that create or ameliorate or reduce inequality. So he starts talking about what he called ternary, so ternary societies, there are basically societies in which you have like some nobility, uh, the military and the gentry. And it's basically two sectors within those societies actually had access to rights as human beings and the other ones were like serfs, right? And these were pretty much the feudal states. Then he goes into trying to analyze how that changed as different countries undertook colonial uh, projects and colonialism across the world and how that affected different degrees of inequalities and how that created one of the most unequal structures of, uh, beyond the nation state, because it was basically projecting the idea of economic growth to the exploitation of other societies. Uh, then <clears throat> he comes more to the 20th century and then he starts to discuss the evolution of the social democratic system and how that emerged on the, on the 20th century as well as the evolution of the hypercapitalism. That is what we can actually see now. If you want to check, please go and check what is happening with this, the, 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 the Johannesburg Stock Exchange since the pandemic struck. So when the, the country is losing thousands of people, when the world is losing thousands of jobs and people, the stocks are going higher. And that presents like really interesting analytical questions about how we think about inequality and the systems in which economies operate. Then he talks about the, the new debates related to identity politics and how that is skewing the political system related to a problem of representation and the power of citizens to have their voice heard, that he labels the Brahmin left and identity politics, right? But he's not only described, that's, that's basically the, 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 the preamble to what he brings. The, 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 the juice of his book is on his chapter 17 when he actually talks about a series of policy proposals. The, the interesting thing about his policy proposals is like he's not necessarily creating any, anything out of scratch. He just basically, through history, is analyzing what alternatives have been implemented and what is the degree of success of those policies in reducing inequality. So he basically does a historical summary of policies implemented across the world and an and and interesting new initiative that he actually proposes. Uh, in general, he brings the idea of like thinking about how we share the world, uh, how we understand ownership, if we see ownership as something more as temporary rather right, than like as going for or, or, or at, at infinitum. And then he tries to think of how can we like negotiate processes in which the information between different countries allow us to know more about taxes and capital and how to allow citizens and society to create more uh, robust social compacts in which the processes uh, relate to the ownership of, of companies and capital by different sectors of societies, not just a capitalist sector, so to speak. For those of you who don't have the time, who are interested in like understanding a little bit these ideas and a different discussion with a different accent to mine, uh, there's this, this podcast called the Political Economy Podcast, where you can have like a really good summary in 25 minutes. Where the, where, the, where the person who does that podcast, podcast manages to summarize Piketty's book in a really nice way. Okay, but Piketty not only that, does this, I think like what is interesting to think about Piketty is that he actually manages to 
to frame his analysis in relation with different literatures, including Milanovich, as I mentioned before, Atkinson's and others, right? And what he does, what, uh, looking at history and looking at other cases that is important for him, is to try to bring different contexts in which inequality is created or reduced to try to understand what is the mechanism that brings about increases or reductions in inequality, right? And this departs from a previous critique to his previous book, because the previous book was pretty much looking at Northern Europe and the US and Canada, right? And what a lot of the, 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 the commentaries that critique the previous book mentioned that he was sidelining the experiences of a great deal of the world population, and perhaps he was missing a little bit of the knowledge and experiences of those places. So he tries to do this, and that's why like, the book is so big because basically he's trying to deal with experiences in Japan, India, Haiti, et cetera, et cetera Brazil, among other countries, but he cannot cover the whole world. So, so we need to be fair with him on that. But I think like what is interesting about that is that he can like filter all that, that diversity across the globe to try to see what policies works and what policies doesn't. And what is interesting about that is that he brings this to see how policy can make a difference in inequality. So it's not necessarily something that is inevitable or, or something that we won't be able to solve. It's something that like through policy can change. And for that, he follows the evolution of some countries in which inequality was extremely high and then it decreases, showing that this is possible in different contexts, right? However, there's one big question that remains about Piketty's new book and is where is Africa? So we have a document talking thousands of pages uh, about the, the history of inequalities. It speaks about the importance of different contexts. But to a great extent, Africa is, is not covered in the book, no more than eight to 10 pages. And also Africa as a continent presents like really interesting insights because the continent as a whole, first of all, is extremely diverse. But secondly, the, 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 the changes in inequality in Africa has had not been as bad as in other countries in the world. That brings a question to, to, to think about why is this happening. The second one is there's uh, some pockets of extreme high inequality within the continent that are important to analyze, Southern Africa. And I'm not talking just about South Africa, I'm talking about Mozambique, Angola, Zambia and the like, right? And that, have like extremely high levels of inequality and they could teach you something because they also relate to a context of a political economy of the legacies of colonialism. I mean, colonialism ended in, a, in, in the continent less than 60 or 70 years ago. It's fairly young. And that brings a lot of insights of how the political economy of global finances can condition or facilitate processes that reduce or increase inequality. Right? <clears throat> and this is where we come. And then we say, okay, so let's talk about South Africa. But if we're going to talk about South Africa, the first thing that we need to do, to be fair, is to recognize that South Africa is part of Africa, but South Africa cannot claim to be representative of the whole continent. And we could argue as well that it's unlikely that a single country can represent the diversity of more than 50 nations. So that's important to have in mind. However, the case of South Africa can illustrate four important things. The first thing is like how well-intentioned policies can fail. And that lesson about the failing can lead us to understand why policies fail to make them better. The second one is like how the policy space of what is feasible, desirable, and convenient is conditioned by international discourses. So it's not only what a country thinks is right, it's also what they can do in relation to the international community. The third one that is, ex is also like extremely important is how the idea or the debate between ideology and policy are co-constructed co by both local and international factors. This relates with the previous point. And finally, and this goes to, to something that I mentioned before, is how colonial relations and their legacies condition and create a path dependence of what happens within the regimes and the structures of countries in the long term. So yes, colony happened, but still we cannot forget that it happened. 
So that's so important to think about how then that, that makes us think about inequalities and how to deal with that, right? And a, referencing a fellow Colombian, Shakira, I would say it's time for Africa, right? To bring our own voice and to, to be able to reflect on our own knowledges that is important for this type of debates. And now going, going to the case of South Africa, what, what I'm going to debate here or rather present what, it, what it has happened with the inequality in the country. <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'm going to illustrate this with a couple of graphs and most of them through cartoons because they like bring a, a, a more clear image of the tensions that like, are faced by the country. In particular, I'm using like some cartoons of a famous uh, South African cartoonist uh, called Shapiro. Uh, but the truth is that South, the inequality of South Africa is not from now. It's, it's the legacy of apartheid, right? So then you see these cartoons of Mandela during the state of the nation and speak to the whole country. It was already dealing with a legacy of, of enforced segregation through violence, right? And that was what like, the, the country faced in 94. Uh, however, in spite of the efforts of the government where they have been well designed, well-intentioned, well-funded, uh, well-planned, uh, they haven't managed to crack inequality. So inequality is extremely, extremely resilient. Uh, and this is illustrated by one of the graphs of the World Income Database uh, from the team of uh, Piketty and, and, and there's also similar figures for South Africa, but it seems inequality is not yielding, right? Uh, <clears throat> something also that is important to mention here is like, in spite of those efforts, we, whereas, racial or between racial groups inequalities have declined, is it still extremely high? So it's better, but it's still bad, you know? So for example, when you have this graph, you can see different distributions of income for South Africans. This is based on data from the NITS uh, survey, and this is looking at different uh, racial categories. And then you can see like as if it has like three or different population groups that behave almost in independent distributions, having that the white South Africans have a bit better income on average. Uh, Indian South Africans are kind of like an in-betweener between different racial groups, and colored and black South Africans seem to be aligned within the distribution. But it's still, if, if this was a, a less unequal society, all of them would kind of like overlap to an extent to each other, but that's not the case, right? Uh, and then that, that also brings the case of unemployment and how is this affecting these processes. The most recent figures from, from Stats SA re, re, released recently, they speak about like a 30.8% uh, of unemployment. And if we check some of the facts that we know that it's like 80 to 90% of the Gini on income is due to employment and we have like more than one third of the whole country unemployed of the working population then we have like a, a strong forces creating this inequality right having said that i haven't mentioned that income and labor incomes are important in creating inequality well is also important and it's becoming more important according to the what like has been found by Basier and Buller. Uh, and and also like what is interesting to observe is like Similar to what Piketty proposed in his first, in his 2014 book, the, 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 the top income brackets of South Africa are growing faster than the economy of the country after 2008, 2009. And for that, we have like a small graph here showing how like the earnings per month, this is between 2011 and 2015, have been increasing. And what I, I am pointing here is like the top 1%. Their salaries are increasing, and also for the two, uh, the top two percent, or but the rest of the distribution seem to not to have like increasing uh, earnings, and that's interesting to think. And what is creating those earnings if salaries are not necessarily increasing? Is first the, the 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 higher salaries for the top income earners, but also wealth, and that's why Ortofer has found like the wealth index uh, Gini index for South Africa is 0 0.9 to 0.95 in the country. Uh, and that's why like uh, when we talk about inequality in the country, uh, some people mentioned that what we have in South Africa is something that is like a game of bro uh, like a broken ladder with like loaded dice because people cannot get the ladder to go up in the social scale and gain some mobility. 
Uh, again, a small illustration here from Shapiro on this. And the whole idea that these poverty traps that create inequality and that relate to inequality affect disproportionately women, black South Africans, people in rural areas, and people living in what they call in South Africa townships. Uh, and, it's a, and it's a particular group that gets trapped in, uh, in, in the compounding of all these uh, the inequities created by each one of these categories. This brings the question that like, okay, I mean, on the one hand, South Africa earned democracy and democratic representation after 94, but still it hasn't been able to undo the inequities created by not only apartheid and its racial project, but also like the legacy of the colonial past that affects the country, right? Because in 2020, livelihoods and opportunities, and I am reading this from the slide, continue to be bound by racial categories. And what you find in South Africa is that special, play, like special, uh, special segregation correlates with skin color, provision of public services, opportunities, and rewards. And this is something that is really interesting to think because when South Africa started the transition, the idea was that freedom was going to be achieved. And then what like the majority of the population is, is facing is, is, is strong delays in being able to break the barriers for social mobility, right? So having said that, South Africa has implemented a series of policies that have been quite interesting. And, but, at the same time, the, the, the co coherence of some of those strategies is not necessarily convincing to address uh, inequality. So, and this is, this is a, a particular cartoon that I think is, is extremely illustrative of, of what it happens because South Africa has really nice policy documents when you check what, what, what needs to be done. And it lays out who needs to receive what, how are we going to break poverty, really nicely worded, Etc. 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 But when it comes into practice, the implement, implementation limps, and the problem of like a faulty or like a weak implementation is that policy never gets to fulfill its mandate, and that's part of the problem of how do, do, do we think about breaking inequality. It's not only about the theory, it's not only about the policy proposal, it's not only about the budget, it's also about the implementation, right? Uh, but they have like three layers of policies that have been implemented and that we label as policies implemented within the existing structure of the economy, that is trying to work with the economy the way it is and trying to change things here and there. Uh, policies aiming to nudge the direction of the economy, policies that is trying to create incentives for segments of the population to change some, uh, some of the structures or the dynamics within the economy, or more what they would say radical policies that actually try to change the structure of ownership. So reallocating capital, reallocating land, reallocating right, so to speak, uh, and, and South Africa has implemented those three. Uh, and, and the interesting thing is like some of the things that South Africa has done in a lot of countries has, haven't, has, have not been implemented to that extent or ha haven't dealt with that compounding of different inequalities and categories. And that makes it extremely interesting to, to, to make us think about the South African case, right? So when it comes to policies related with the structure of the economy, South Africa has implemented an, an interesting series of labor market reforms to give more, more rights to the workers, uh, uh, allowing them to have minimum wage. Now they recently signed a minimum wage bill that is a national minimum wage. You can check Dinkelman and, and Ranchot's paper for that. Uh, and, uh, and also like a, something that like ha is more clear now because of, of, of the grants uh, due to COVID, but the, the system of cash transfers has been like a really interesting policy tool for South Africa with interesting results. That what I show here is, is basically a, every line on top of this black 45 degree lane basically means that you're helping to reduce inequality. And it seems like the transfers that South Africa has implemented, not only in their coverage, they're extremely effective, not only in their reach, they're extremely effective, but they're also helping people. They're actually helping. It's, it's not helping to the extent that it, they reduce inequality, but they're a really important shock absorber for the forces that are trying to push inequality higher. And this has happened as one of the policy responses of South Africa. Uh, and this, like, uh, this image in particular is taken from like a paper from Ashekwan Wooler that is quite like a nice paper to check. 
for those interested. However, there's a big question, and it's like, what is happening with the taxes and wealth? South Africa is starting to have these discussions, and there's a really nice a, a paper from, from Basir and Woolard, I mentioned that before, that basically talks about the number of millionaires in South Africa, and how that, that, that segment of society seems to be a, a growing force that is creating inequality in the nation. But this is not a new debate. This has been happening since 1994, I guess. Right? And, and, and the whole idea of taxation and, 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 and equality is, is something that we need to, to engage with and it's something that Piketty also raises strongly in his, in his book. Uh, with a different case, perhaps, that South Africa is a country that was coming out, out of an armed confrontation. Uh, but it's still having these debates about wealth and, and taxes seem, for some reason, be, be politically difficult. Uh, now, then, then we had like a series of policies trying to change the direction of the economy. You have like a, a policy that would relate to what they, is called guaranteed employment, the community works po uh, program or the expanded public works program. Uh, there's also like, like something that is in, uh, extremely interesting is the, is the housing policies that is uh, related with what they know in South Africa as RDPs, but different like um, policies trying to increase the, how, the provision of housing for people so they have a roof on, over their heads, but also as a way to create assets uh, that they can leverage to open a bank account, get a loan, be able to pay for a university education, and so on and so forth. So like th that is an interesting policy because it has been able to roll out millions of houses, right? The impact, not as clear because inequality is still the same. Uh, the, the idea of regulating the markets from a, from, from a system like where there's like an open economy to one in which you almost like suffer like a transition like that was similar to kind of like a perestroika glass notes and, and some sort of like a cartels operating that still are there. And they have like a push to fix prices. And for example, this cartoon illustrated like the price fixing for bread in a country where there's people with like a, a, an important segment of the population uh, on poverty, that's almost a crime, but it still happens, right? And they've been trying to like to, to create regulations and systems and institutions to enforce some of the regulations that are being, in, are being drafted in the parliament, right? However, one of the interesting things that we also found is seems like one of the most effective uh, tools for, for reducing inequality has been mobilization of citizens, not necessarily to, to change inequality across the whole nation, but in relation to specific policies and demands. Uh, a case in point, the, 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 the ARBs and the HIV AIDS campaigns that try to reduce the inequities in the provision of medicines uh, that achieved some significant changes, uh, but after losing more than 300,000 people. Uh, so that is something that has taken place here in South Africa as well. And finally, I think there's like also like other interesting policies that relate to, to the changes in the structure of the economy. Uh, what they would be calling like participatory socialism in South Africa, for those who are not in South Africa or don't know a lot of the context of South Africa, there's something that is called the tripartite alliance. So when the ANC came to power, they came with the South African Communist Party and the Confederation of South African Trade Unions. That's one of the bigger, biggest umbrella union umbrellas in the country. And they came together to power, right? And that created the idea that, okay, so like if you speak with the people from the Communist Party and with the workers, and perhaps you will understand the interests of, of, of the society and bring some policies there. But the truth is that the, 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 the tripartite alliance has been a more a symbol than a practice uh, for different reasons that we can discuss later, right? But also there's like interesting initiatives like so, so, such as the BEE, the Black Economic Empowerment or the triple B double E that have, have aimed to empower specific uh, groups within the population. And in this case, they talk about Black South Africans and Black South Africans as uh, the category that they use in the policy to come in disenfranchised South Africans. So it goes beyond a particular racial category to try to allow them to have capital and ownership and more weight within the, 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 the companies. So they can become owners of the assets, right? But the results of those policies have been limited to a, to a great extent. And what has been found by Darren Asemoglu and his team in 2007 
was basically that was like linked, the, the benefits of those policies were linked to particular political cliques. So if you're close to a particular political party, in this case, ANC, and uh, particular uh, policy operators, you are more likely to get benefit from this. So they haven't been that successful. And also like we have like what is, what is land restitution, reparation and redistribution in South Africa that like the government has tried to redistribute like hectares because the, like the land is a really important symbol. Uh, because in 913, pretty much black South Africans were expropriated by white South Africans by decree. Uh, but still the government is lagging and, and the government is redistributing land, but the land is not coming to the people who, who need it the most, farm workers. Uh, or some black communities in the country. So like that's still presenting questions about how these processes work and what they actually achieve. Here by the, 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 the cartoon that I present here because the whole series of promises that were affirmed in the, in the transition from 94 was a country for all. But what is happening at the end is that these processes are not, are not arriving yet there. And they're becoming more tricky to an extent because in a way, South Africa implemented a good series of policies, but it went from a really uh, overt uh, mechanism of repression with caspers to something more subtle, in which your accent, what they call in South Africa, a model C, is what conditions your access to opportunities, rewards, and a livelihood. They're harder to spot because they operate almost invisibly, but they're equally felt and suffered by people. And that's an extremely difficult question because when you have something that is overt and is explicit, it's hard to find it and to fix it. But when you get a CV, and if the CV has like a, a, a name that is not in English and that creates some segregation in the selection processes, that's hard to see and that's hard to account for. The same thing with the accents, the same with thing with when they ask people, where do you live in? And that conditions your access to networks, groups, peoples, opportunities, and conditions, right? And this brings the point that there's something that is still extremely entrenched, and is the the the, the role of, of what they, what we call well we don't call this this is Charles Tilly and different sociologists, but what we refer as categorical divides, and these particular sets of of labels that keep taking place. Uh, but in spite of the challenges of all these policies uh, failing to reduce inequality, I think it's something that is important to mention is that like this, this is not a message that is trying to say that policies should be scrapped. We're just trying to see how policies can improve so we can figure out how this happened and how we can reduce inequality. One way in which we find that can be interesting to think about, and I'm going to show like a map that was worked with, uh, by David and other authors, is that in fact space can allow us to illustrate how this compounding of different layers of inequality can take place. So we can figure out how policy can be honed to respond to the needs of a particular area and a particular group in a, partic in a, in a particular set of categories. <clears throat> for example, for women uh, uh, living in the Eastern Cape, they might have a, a different need in terms of the barriers for accessing education compared to uh, women in the Western Cape. Right? And that can allow us to understand then how to operate in terms of the policy space. So the question is like, okay, so we know inequalities are there, we know inequalities are bad, but now we have like something that is a little bit more complicated because we need to think of uh, racial categories, uh, gender, space, and, and class, and how those four can like link and like, and, and, condition the opportunities and the, and the rewards for people. Uh, however, the case of South Africa also illustrates the, the, the limits of the discourses. Because in South Africa, there's a lot of talking about inequality and, uh, and, and, and what I refer as the comrades speak, that in some policy circles, people talk about, talks about like a socialist discourse, but the policy practice is, is not necessarily that. And that creates some, some questions about like how you can reform the structure of the economy when the economy has pretty much being the same and benefiting the, the same groups, the ones at top of these pyramids of categories, right? And, and that's a little bit interesting because in the case of South Africa, what, what I feel is there is like a, that the discourse moves in one direction, but inequality moves in a different one. So whereas people talk about equality and policies trying to reduce a, a, a inequality, we observe increasing 
poverty, precariousness, and, and so on after more than 20 years. So that brings question about like, how do we, how do we understand this? Because to an extent, it feels like South Africa presents like a little bit of a cognitive dissonance where one part of the, the policy space goes in one direction and the other one goes in a different direction. Uh, and, at this, and, and the interesting thing of this is like both policy messages seem to speak to different constituents, which in the policy space of a segregated uh, policy that is what we're observing now with social media seems to be working, but it doesn't help to, to think about what policies are, are, are required that need to be implemented in order to, to figure out how we deal with categorical inequalities. With these, are like I, I, will, I would like to bring your attention to a couple of things that like are important for those interested in, in looking at inequality. And it's, there, there's a series of reports on the Acer webpage and related to inequality diagnostic reports. Uh, one really interesting made for the for Ghana, and these are reports that have been worked with the statistician general's offices in each country. One for South Africa that was released uh, some time before and one in Kenya that is coming out now. Well, not now, but soon. So for those interested in learning more about inequalities in the continent by academics in the continent, those are interesting resources. Another one is like, there's a really interesting handbook for those who want to understand better how to measure inequality. Check the webpage. There's an interesting guideline written by uh, Ranchud and Shifa. There is just really good and really like enlightening. And there's also like a couple of working papers of the things that we're working on for those who want to read that. Also, for those who do the social media, this is uh, like our hashtag. And like, if, I think I'll we'll try to send the presentation and then you can click on this if you want to join the newsletter. So I think that's it in 37 minutes. So we got a little bit more time. Thank you, Fabio. You did a great job. So are there any questions or comments for Fabio? Uh, raise your hands. Mary, do you want to say anything before we open for the for everyone? No, thanks. It's great. Okay, cool. Raise your hands, Thomas. Thank you uh, for the interesting presentation. Um, one question, I, I just context. I'm based in South Africa. Uh, I'm I'm at the Sociology and the Politics Department at UCT with Jeremy Seekings. Um, and I, I look at perceptions of inequality and, and how ordinary people understand levels of inequality. And there's, there's been, you know, increasing research, um, people like Loveless or Gimbelson Treisman recently, who really show how, let's call it objective levels of economic inequality and subjective perceptions um, really often don't match up. Um, and I, I was just wondering whether, whether you had any insights in the South African example. Um, I recall, for instance, if you look at the ISSP data uh, from a few years ago, that really how people compare their own living situation to the past or how they expect their living situation to the future has, has a much stronger influence on how they perceive themselves relative to other groups in society. Uh, than, for, for example, uh, objective levels. So the question, I guess, uh, that, I'm, that I'm asking is, uh, objectively, we can measure levels of inequality, but if we link it to policy and how people might evaluate policy, you know, does, does let's say, the, the, the mean South African, who in South Africa doesn't really represent uh, much because of the, um, the high outliers at the top end of the in income distribution, but... But do, 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 do those people really compare themselves to the top people? You know, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a student. I don't necessarily compare myself to, you know, the people in the township. And I don't necessarily compare myself to the people, you know, that live in the, in the Stellenbosch, uh, you know, gated communities. Uh, so my reference group is, is, is much more limited than really the entirety of the income distribution. So um, how, how does that really factor into us understanding the success of policy, which I guess always brings into question how people evaluate inequality and whether or not objective levels of inequality are uh, valid instruments of assessing policy in Africa. Um, so that would be my question. Thank you. Okay. Mimo, should I answer now or do you want to receive more questions? Yeah, I can't see any other hands, so okay. please go ahead. 
Okay, well, I think I think there's something that I didn't mention about uh, Piketty's book, and it's quite nice as an entry point for opening this this discussion. And it's like, actually, in, like Piketty makes a really nice point about saying like data is not nothing more than a social construct, right? So he's, he's not aiming to relativize data, but he just brings into the for the the discussion how we need to think of data as measuring what we think is important and how we decide how to measure it, like can change the way we do it. That's the starting point. And I think what you mean now in, in relation of like the perceptions of inequality and, and, and how that conditions, uh, not only like how we see if the policy is successful, but also like a political participation, a legitimacy of state institutions. I think it's really, it's really important. I think like one thing that I, the way I see it is I think like, like inequality is, is relational. The question is relational between whom and whom. And that's a, that's a tricky question. A lot of development economists, uh, for example, uh, Francis Stewart, like they were talking about horizontal inequalities, right? When you compare group A and group B. Uh, but the reality, the way I understand it, is that different groups might operate on the different lenses for the comparison. So it might be the case that I, I compare myself against someone that I see in the street. I might compare myself against what I see as desirable in my social media feed. I mean, where is that like my Twitter or my WhatsApp or whatever I use, uh, assuming that I have access to data. That is not necessarily the case for a lot of South Africans. Uh, but I think that, that that makes it harder to account for. That's the first element that I think makes it harder. The second element that, that is quite tricky is that perceptions are important, but they can be extremely volatile in one dimension, but they can be extremely slow in another dimension. Like, so, so when things are the same, I don't think people feel that it changes a lot, but then when it jumps for worse or for, for better, it, it feels that change can be perceived as more drastic. And for this, I think like two, uh, two, two notions that come to my head is, is someone who spoke about relative deprivation, is uh, Ted Robert Gurr. Uh, and, and also Hirschman when he talks about the tunnel effect. Because when, when Gerd was talking about relative deprivation, he actually spoke of different dimensions along which you can feel deprived. Deprived because you're actually doing worse compared to someone, in spite that you're doing better, in inverted commas. Uh, deprived because you're effectively doing worse or, 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 or deprived because the other group is doing better than your group, in spite that both of you are doing well. So that's one, and, and that's one that, that is interesting. And another one is like Hirschman. He has like a nice a paper from the 70s that he talks about this thing that when you're like in a, in a highway and then you see one line is moving faster than the other. And I think those are kind of like interesting entry points to think about it. Now, the, 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 given the, the, the identity politics now, how is that instrumentalized and to some extent weaponized by different political actors, I think it makes it extremely tricky and I think harder to see because if we look like perceptions really close to each other on time, we might see a lot of volatility, uh, but in the longer period of time, we might be missing some, some of the elements that explain that volatility. So I, I don't have a clear answer for that. That's more like a, like a conversation about, about your question. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a, a comment, a question from Jeremy Seekings in the chat box. And he says he doesn't know or he doesn't have perhaps a raise his hand option. So here's the question. The issue is about wealth and that the empirical literature in South Africa doesn't pay much attention to wealth. So how much does Piketty have to offer our understanding? of Income inequalities in South Africa, given that we keep talking about the labor market aspect mm -hmm. of it. Okay. Okay, I'll try to respond to this. It's kind of like a, like a, I mean, people devote their lives to try to understand these questions. So I'll try to bring like a, a couple of nuggets from the ring of Piketty. There's something that is really nice from Piketty's book. And he actually speaks of ownership as something temporary. So if you have a car, if you have a house, if you have an asset, you don't have it forever. And how he operationalizes this uh, understanding of ownership is through taxes. So through taxes, you basically chip a little bit of the price of, a, of, of, a, of an asset across time. And that's what we do with taxes, right? So I think like, I, I think in that sense, he brings home the, the idea that like, 
uh, the importance of wealth and how to do it. He, he also has like a really interesting debate about saying, look, when they survey people in France and they ask them what they, would they prefer, something like a 30% once off wealth tax or something that is on a yearly basis at a, sh a lower level, let's say two, 3%, I'm forgetting the, the figures now. People actually prefer to pay a wealth tax on a, on a, on a continuous basis at, at a lower level, right? And the thing is like, like wealth in a, in a, in a, in a, in a case is, is not necessarily as visible, but it's extremely sticky in, in explaining inequality. You can have really a, a really good salary, but you're never going to get into that club. And for people who are trying to break social mobility traps, that's clear that what is happening for them. For someone who studies in a good university, who gets to speak English in a particular accent, and they're still dismissed in their own humanity, they know this is what is happening. And I think like then, then, then I think like the case of Piketty bringing the evidence of cases where actually this has changed and can work is, 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 is talks to the case of South Africa. Now coming to the, the, the data issue and the empirical liter literature in South Africa, I think there's a couple of elements and is the, the, the data and wealth until recent years in a lot of countries have been quite limited because of the way the taxation system works and the accounting system works. So this research is, that's why the reference that we have on that, they are coming from 2016 onwards because the data is more accessible. And being able to have access to the data allows us to know better about what is the role of these wealth inequalities and we can understand better the structure. So for example, this paper that I mentioned from Basier and Woolard actually like uh, triples the estimate of the number of millionaires in US dollars in South Africa. But before that, if we don't have the data, we, we cannot know. We can't just speculate. There's too many or too little millionaires. But knowing that, we can understand where that money is going, if that money is productive, and how can you use those resources or taxes from those resources to facilitate policies to create change. So, so I think like knowing the data uh, helps uh, a little bit, but I think also like South Africa can bring interesting questions and, and insights when we start to think a little bit about the land, because land is an asset and land represents wealth. Uh, but, we, but it's not being taxed as, as, as much or, or the debates about how to deal with that are really uh, politicized here. But I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's ways in which you can like create policy options for this. Great, thank you, Fabio. Um, are there any other questions? I can't see any hands. Is there anyone who has a question but doesn't know how to raise their hand? Abena. Hi, greetings from Accra. Um, have you, in the, looking at um, the policies and how they, were, they could be constrained, you mentioned lack of implementation and then you mentioned the legacy of apartheid and uh, colonialism. But in your introductory statements, you also mentioned the constraints that external factors could mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. Would you elaborate on that a little bit in terms of an example, if you can give one? I, uh, if I, I, I would mention the case of South Africa. So, yes, I mean, there's, there's a lot of debate about South Africa in terms of like South Africa didn't do enough in 94, right? But when we place that in, in the context of South Africa and, and the world in 1994, uh, the, the, the Soviet Union had, had, had fallen, neoliberalism was king. Uh, Clinton was a president. So like that, that, that limits what is feasible, right? So if you come in any country, it doesn't matter if you have a Madiba or not. If you come and then you're going to say, I'm going to expropriate everyone, it's a tricky sale. And the problem is because the way the colonial relations change from violence through guns and boats, through financial uh, spread rates, rates of, of, of interest rates for, you, for your bonds, it is, it is really tricky for governments to implement policy because you have to negotiate those two seats, right? So you want to respond to the needs of your country, but at the same time, you, you cannot be suicidal. And I think that's, that's one of the things that like thinking about Africa is really important because uh, if you go to Francophone Africa, if you go to Lusophone Africa, if you go to Anglophone Africa, those links are still there and they, they affect what policies are, are, are considered as feasible or not. And, and I think like one of the ways Piketty suggests this could be dealt with is like through more cooperation between the countries, more global cooperation, understanding taxes and tax havens. So for example, if you think about the amount of money from the continent that goes to tax havens and you're not paying taxes, 
Well, it would be nice to know who has what, so, you, so they can be taxed and, and help to build the development of the continent, right? And it's, it's not, not, nothing revolutionary. In fact, that's how they build Europe, through taxes. Well, when they were not colonizing the rest of the world. But, but, but I think it is important to, to, to be able to know how can we do that within the policy space. And that's, 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 that's still like an open question. But I'm just illustrating here the case of the, the, the restrictions. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Thomas again. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, talking about political solutions, one word that I at least didn't hear come up was, uh, was, was the word corruption. Uh, and, and maybe how, uh, you know, Piketty's, uh, or at least how you describe them, I, I admit I haven't read the book, I'm relying uh, exclusively on the presentation. But in what ways does, does uh, Piketty's uh, recommendations in, in Chapter 7 or his approach, uh, how, how feasible are those maybe from your perception in the context of South Africa uh, specifically, but Africa maybe more generally, uh, where maybe uh, as a result of colonialism, we do have you know, the, the situation of entrenched political elites that maybe have an interest in actually you know, keeping, keeping the, uh, the transparency of data limited and murky rather than actually facilitating uh, greater insights and, and, and thus uh, enabling policy that would allow for redistribution. How, how much do you think um, the, the willingness of, the, the, the truthful willingness of political elites actually is something that is assumed by Piketty that may or may not be actually uh, a description of re real conditions in, in, in some countries or at least in some cases? Well, I think, I think, I think a couple of things here. I think the first thing is like, to be honest, like Piketty doesn't really speak about corruption a lot, you know? But I think he speaks about corruption in the allocation of representation and how that, 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 that asymmetry between citizens and governments are created by the way in which people with resources can influence policy processes to favor their own interests. So that's the corruption that he, he discusses there, right? So that's the first element. But, but he also makes a point that is, is quite valid, and I think that resonates a lot with South Africa, and he speaks about mobilization, and he uses that term, right? And, and, and when, when he talks about the French, French Revolution, that's mobilization that created changes. But even Piketty like, acknowledges, and he mentioned this in, in, the, in the Nelson Mandela lecture that he gave in 2015, was that, in fact, the, the French Revolution came, but there were not really changes for the next century in the, in the structure of inequalities in France. Yes, there was like a, a lot of turmoil, but the changes don't really take a lot of place. And the same thing with Europe. I mean, when you think Sweden was like an extremely unequal country in which votes were allocated as a, as a function of wealth. Uh, but then when people mobilized and when there were like some, some, some mobilization, they managed to change that. So I think like civil engagement is something that plays an extremely important value there. And South Africa had that and has that. I think like in the case of South Africa, it's a little bit more tricky because the ANC as a political party became so big that in a way kind of like it suffocated the different streams of, of mobilization, right? Because it, was, it, is, it is a liberation party. And that makes the, the, the political debates and this contention uh, more difficult. Uh, but that's, that's central to the process. And I think that's central to facilitate checks and balances uh, and, and, and to fight corruption. Uh, I, I would say, having said that, that we should be careful of talking of, as corruption as being an African thing, uh, because then we end up like repeating tropes. I'm not saying there's no corruption here, but the corruption operates in different levels of sophistication. So when the, the, the countries in the North sell guns to the South, and I'm not talking here about like the, the, the guns, uh, gold slaves, triangle. I'm talking about the 21st century. Uh, that is still happens there, and that's a particular kind of corruption that is overseen, right? So I think like we need, we need to name things by the are, but we shouldn't idealize uh, particular political systems, as we can see in the U.S. Uh, it's facing similar challenges, if not, but more blatantly than what we expected. So that's always lurking, and I think mobilization is, is key, the way I see it. Hi. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, nobody else. Thank you, Fabio. You did an excellent job. Super interesting talk. And thank you to all our participants for attending and participating. And we'll send out the flyer for the next one.
with itself. Thank you for coming. Ciao. Thanks, Fabio. Ciao, ciao.